it is my great pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Mohammad Ali Pate. He is the Global Director of Health, Nutrition and Population Global Practice of the World Bank and the Director of the Global Financing Facility for Women, Children and Adolescents, also called the GFF, based in Washington, D.C. Dr. Pate was recently, until recently, the Chief Executive Officer of Big Win Philanthropy, based in UK, and prior to that held several senior positions, including that of Minister of State for Health in the Federal Republic of Nigeria. He was previously in the World Bank Group, where he joined as a young professional in 2000 and worked on health issues in several regions, including Africa, East Asia, and the Pacific. Dr. Pate is an MD trained in both internal medicine and infectious diseases with an MBA from Duke University. Prior to this, he studied at the University College London. He also has a master's in health systems management from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine in UK. It's just wonderful to see this background, not only uh, a trained physician, but also uh, expert in infectious diseases and brings a business background. Um, just wonderful to see these combinations. And Dr. Pate, before I hand over to you, just to, um, we have the largest contingent from Nigeria, by the way, uh, in this conference. And they have always been the largest contingent uh, coming to this conference. So uh, over to you, Dr. Pate. Uh, really great to uh, have you here. Thank you. Thank you, Ravi, and all the organizers for inviting me uh, to, to, to share with you a few thoughts. Let me um, now share my screen, and I hope works because we had tested it. Very good. Yes, I hope you can see very clearly uh, my presentation. My purpose is basically to share with you a few thoughts, uh, introducing the bank group, which I know many of you are familiar with, and the global financing facility, and some of the work that we've been doing with our partners, some of whom are already here, USAID, the Global Fund, Gavi, and others uh, on supply chains and then give you a flavor of the bank's work on the COVID-19 pandemic response, and then suggest a few thoughts on the way forward, where we go from here. And then uh, I hope you'll find it useful. So for those who are not familiar with the bank, the bank group basically has twin goals. One is to end extreme poverty by reducing the share of global population that lives in extreme poverty, that is less than $1.90 uh, per day to 3%, and promote shared prosperity. Those are our North Star as the World Bank Group. The Bank Group is basically five institutions and uh, it's not just one institution. IBRD, the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development is the original, the bank, if you, if you, if you, so to speak, which started after the Second World War and that focused on middle income countries now. And then IDA is the International Development Association that gives concessional financing to low-income countries that deal with governments primarily. Now, on the private sector side, the bank group has the International Finance Corporation, which deals and lends to the private sector and the Multilateral Investment Guarantee Agency. And then the fifth entity is the International Center for Settlement of Investment Disputes, which sort of arbitrates investment disputes. And the products or the tools that the bank uses include the financing of countries, private sector entities, and various products in that line, as well as services that allow our clients to really uh, move closer to the North Star that I had spoken to. The second element is that of knowledge sharing, which you alluded to, Ravi, in terms of drawing from the implementation experience across the globe and sharing knowledge across countries, across regions, as a global uh, let's, let's say knowledge bank. And then we also provide advisory services for a whole range of countries based on the analysis that we do, but also by convening other stakeholders, other institutions to work with us in understanding, driving insights and moving the agendas forward. And the way we work basically is focused on countries in terms of the IDA and IBRD. We start with detailed systematic country diagnostics to understand the situation of the country, the bottleneck that it is facing, and then develop a partnership framework with the country, which then allows us to have an investment that is really designed together with the government leadership, within which there will be individual projects and programs. And as we implement then, uh, review our performance and learn from that, uh, from the experience, what's working, what's not working, and be able to cost correct. And upon completion, 
also have more detailed learning. As you can see, there's a huge um, premium being put on learning uh, in a very complex development environment as we implement along with our client uh, country governments as partners. So in terms of what's the bank's um, interest or role in health, this slide basically tries to give you a sense of how the bank's health sector commitments have sort of evolved over the last several years. As you can see, FY20 basically saw an upsurge. This is as of June 2020 in terms of the bank's investments in health, about 4 billion in the IBRD countries, and as well as 4.2 uh, 4 billion in the IDA countries, a huge leap upwards. This is going to be even much more. So just to say that the bank has spent considerable amount of resources along with its clients in the health sector. And um, in terms of our strategic directions, we are aiming in the health practice to help countries to improve their health outcomes at the population level and expand financial protection. And by doing so, contributing to achieving the World Bank's group's twin goals, the North Star that I mentioned, directly through accelerating progress in universal health coverage and strengthening health security at the country level. And indirectly also by building, protecting and employing human capital, preventing mortality, improving nutritional outcomes, and investing in health for sustainable and inclusive economic growth to deal with the equity angle as well, as well as the resilience as we've seen in the destruction that COVID-19 pandemic has unfolded in health, but also outside health sectors. And you mentioned that it's a key agenda in terms of how we think about our work. We've got three strategic priorities. One is to push for high quality health systems uh, with primary health care at the foundation of those health systems to safeguard the governance of health for sustainable financing and to have accountability mechanisms for improvement of those outcomes and to augment the service delivery value chain with innovation, data-driven precision public health, medical care, digital technologies, including the role of the private sector in service delivery, including supply chain. That's a key strategic priority for the work that we do in health. And the second pillar of our strategy is to strengthen public health, to reinvigorate the essential public health functions for preventive and promotive health, and to have effective and resilient pandemic preparedness as a response. COVID-19 has just emphasized this, uh, the centrality of this agenda. And then finally, to bring the multi-sectoral heft of the bank. The bank works across sectors in infrastructure, in agriculture, education, all sectors, but that they are related to health. To think of whole of government, multi-sectoral and institutional responses to improve national nutritional and po population outcomes uh, across the countries that we work with. And linked to the bank, and the bank hosts the global financing facility for women, adolescents, and children. This is a partnership that is within the bank, but goes outside the bank. And its goal is to improve, to end preventable maternal child and adolescent deaths by 2030. It was launched in 2015 by the World Bank Group, by Canada, Norway, the Gates Foundation, the UN Secretary General in Addis, at the Financing for Development Conference. And it currently sp uh, supports 36 low and lower middle income countries with the highest burden of maternal and child mortality. And a third of them are fragile, conflict or violence affected states. It facilitates the GFF model is one that basically facilitates country led, country owned multi-stakeholder uh, platforms to develop and implement investment cases, which is their national plans, to catalyze financing and achieve results for women, children, and adolescents' health. It is, able, it is really geared towards enabling countries to translate their visions of universal health coverage into targeted investments that will build functioning primary healthcare systems that are necessary to accelerate the progress and that really deliver affordable healthcare services to their populations. The G GFF, given its mandate, and it's emerged really from the UN Commission on Life-Saving Commodities several years ago, which focused on those commodities that had to be delivered in a way that will save the lives of mothers, newborns, and children. And so commodities are essential piece of the reproductive, maternal, newborn, child, and adolescent health interventions. For those who are not familiar with the acronym, it's quite a mouthful, 
But that's really uh, at the center. You need to deliver the antibiotics, the family planning commodities, uh, the commodities to attend to um, uh, postpartum hemorrhage. Those are very important, simple commodities that can be underutilized because they just don't get to where they need to be used or health workers are not able to use them. So ensuring the safety, quality, availability, and the appropriate in the use of the commodities is paramount to saving the lives of mothers and children uh, all over the world. And, but procurement and distribution are not the only challenges. Uh, there may be other challenges along the way, uh, including in terms of how they are managed, even where they are available, including sort of the human resources and other complementary uh, uh, elements within that. And so the GFF works with partners and in several countries, uh, it is part of a collaboration with various groups, including USAID, the Global Fund, Gavi, and other partners. And I will highlight a few examples, which is not just what the GFF does, but what the partners that work with GFF do in countries in terms of advancing this agenda towards the, end, uh, the goal of ending preventable maternal child and adolescent uh, deaths. So in the, this is really uh, an example uh, from Uganda, one of the GFF uh, countries where uh, the gaps in supply chain uh, practices uh, between district vaccine stores and immunization centers were causing so shortages. So with Gavi, Global Fund, uh, a new last mile distribution partner was selected to pilot the last mile distribution service in three districts. Some of you in this summit may be very much familiar with it. Uh, and it was to ensure that there is equitable allocation of vaccines to facilities, uh, to create a sustainable and timely delivery of vaccines, and to have uh, the, the, the attendance supplies to laboratories also be managed in an end-to-end -end manner. So Gavi co-designed it with the government of, of, of Uganda within the context of a nationally owned partnership of which the GFF was part of. So just to exemplify the sort of partnership model, at the end of the day, you've got lots of global actors. Well, these partnerships only make sense if they work around country-led investment cases in platforms and plans and are executed. In this instance, for instance, that outsourcing led to increased order fulfillment in Uganda. And Ravi, you mentioned several of my compatriots from Nigeria in the summit as well. Uh, they will be familiar with this several vertical supply chains uh, for key health programs. Many years ago, uh, there are at least uh, 45 separate uh, uh, supply chains and um, much of that, that was, uh, uh, let's say, single commodity or just a handful of commodities, very inefficient. And I think with the Global Fund, with the help of USAID, the government of Nigeria and several other partners uh, came together to address that, to really establish an integrated physical logistics flow to improve the visibility and achieve cost efficiency in terms of uh, management of those very disparate uh, uh, supply chains and created steady level capabilities to coordinate all supply chain activities in the states, uh, thanks to many of the partners on the ground. And also to use the private sector capability where appropriate to improve the supply chain performance. In immunization, for instance, I think that was also a separate but complementary effort that improved the availability of commodities in the front lines uh, by just improving how the supply chains were managed. And so after three years, I think there are beginnings of improvements, including new zonal hubs and local uh, uh, availability of, of, of commodities that are delivered in this area, which needs to be sustained in the period ahead. And Mozambique is another example, which I'm sure many of you here are familiar. It's also a GFF country. Again, with multiple partners coming together uh, to do an assessment, uh, to have a link in terms of World Bank financing that is uh, really supporting the primary healthcare system that rewards achievement of certain outcomes and that in fact uh, uh, is helping to, 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 to improve the availability, bringing in the private sector also in managing the supply chains in Mozambique. These are just a couple of examples to give you a sense of how the global work of, of the bank, the work of with its client countries, is not just by itself, but is connected with the other partners that are on the ground, or some of which are bilateral, like the USAID, some of which are philanthropic, like Gates Foundation, and some of which are UN entities like UNICEF and WHO also, who are working uh, with us, but with importance of country leadership, country ownership, 
uh, to move the agenda forward. So I'll move on now to the COVID-19 pandemic, which essentially uh, when it unfolded earlier this year, uh, clearly this is not something that we'd experienced uh, before. And uh, we all scrambled and uh, we uh, tried to see what is the role that a multilateral financing institution like the bank uh, can do. So in early March, uh, the bank's uh, board approved a fast track facility that comprised uh, $6 billion for countries uh, and 8 billion really for the private sector very early on to deal with the emergency response. This was IDA and IBRD financing that is financing for the low income and the middle income countries. And that allowed for existing portfolio of over 2 billion within that 6 billion to be reprogrammed to enable countries deal with the emergency that they were facing. And then for the 8 billion for the IFC to use through the private sector entities, and I'll come to that to help deal with the crisis that was unfolding. More recently, as vaccines became more prominent, the bank in October announced uh, $12 billion additional financing to this uh, framework that we had since March, which makes it 18 billion for countries, which could potentially support financing of vaccines, but also the, importantly, the delivery of the vaccines, because buying the vaccines is one thing, regardless of how they are bought, they have to be delivered. And I'll come to how that uh, is unfolding. And for the, uh, these are the various components of our uh, response, not only buying the kits, equipment, uh, and, and essential supplies, uh, getting them delivered in the emergency component. And there, really, we had to, the global supply chain for commodities was broken. So we had to really adapt uh, to some extent uh, through working with other UN partners and in some places directly matching suppliers with country demands. But beyond that, also helping countries strengthen their multi sectoral national institutions and platforms. At the end of the day, what stays is what you invest in the country in terms of national capability. And thirdly, to also think about the medium longer term because COVID-19 is not going to be the only uh, crisis that we're going to be dealing with. It's come, it's huge, but there will be many others. So laying the foundation for resilience is embedded within the context of our response. And then building another element, which is the community engagement and risk communication, which you often forget because at the end of the day, uh, products get to where they need it, but people have to show up and be willing to use them. And uh, also to learn as we go and provide contingencies, including what we are now using in terms of vaccines. So in terms of the response, the, we've got several really, uh, within a very short period of time, uh, examples of how these resources have been able to uh, contribute to country efforts. In India, thousands of physicians uh, thousands of nurses have been deployed. Treatment facilities were um, established. Isolation beds were provided and uh, laboratories, uh, their testing capabilities were increased. So this was a huge effort uh, by the government of India, but with support from the bank, but also leveraging other multilateral uh, development uh, banks. In Ukraine, Yemen and Haiti and Democratic Republic of Congo, for instance, we were able to support them in getting vital medical equipment. And that also included, in a way, supporting on the supply chain element to ensure that they are delivered. In Ghana, it was more around the human resources, uh, contact tracers, uh, laboratories that were uh, activated, treatment centers, ICU beds, and lots of medicines and supplies that were purchased, but also deployed. In Papua New Guinea, a lot of pop, uh, PPEs, uh, personal protective equipment, were deployed through this support. And in, 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 in Ethiopia, PPE is to protect the frontline health workers. This just to give you a flavor of translating the financing of the bank into the commodities at the global level that have to be delivered at the country level to be embedded within the context of the emergency response, but hopefully also helping build the national systems for delivery long-term. And for the IFC, basically the IFC uh, within the package that the board of the bank group approved, uh, IFC mobilized on the parallel side to support the private sector investments, to meet the urgent needs of developing countries to uh, have access to critical healthcare products and services. We know that almost all the products and services are manufactured in the private sector and have to be delivered, and that they needed to be supported given that this is an unanticipated challenge, and to create the manufacturing and delivery capacities 
because uh, very early on we realized that even the capacity was not uh, was not there to meet the demand that was that we are seeing in terms of the surge of COVID-19 cases. In addition to the behaviors of countries really holding some of their supplies as well, and to help strengthen not only uh, global but also sort of local uh, and regional manufacturing and service capabilities. So service providers, manufacturers of healthcare products and vaccines, supplies of raw materials and components. Basically, this platform was approved by the, by the bank's board, by the IFC's own uh, board, and is available for the private sector to close the massive healthcare supply gaps which emerged in the early days of the COVID-19 pandemic. And as we come to the issue of vaccines, which have now begun, be, begun to look as a very promising uh, way out of this uh, pandemic. There are several vaccines. I wouldn't go into this uh, in many details. And you've been following what is out there in terms of the various annou announcements. There are vaccines uh, of varying uh, uh, price ranges, uh, typologies, uh, some of which are viral vector vaccines, mRNA vaccines, uh, DNA vaccines as well that are in the pipeline, uh, some of which are old virus vaccines and subunit vaccines. Uh, importantly, the implication of what is needed in terms of cold chain infrastructure varies and the, the manufacturing capacities themselves, uh, I think, are, are limited overall, but we're making progress. At this point, there is no vaccine, but we know that we will get a vaccine very shortly. And when we do, how do we allow enable countries to have access to those vaccines and to be able to deliver those vaccines? And in that context, uh, there is a long road to the delivery of vaccines. Getting the vaccine is a good start, but it's not the only one. Uh, from where they are produced to get them to countries where they are stored, to the regional storage capabilities that are needed, to the clinics, to the health workers. So it's quite a, uh, I think that's even more challenging than really the vaccine development itself. And therefore our approach is to say, look, uh, let's look at it uh, broadly, uh, that public sector supply chains in many low and middle income countries have been facing challenges even before COVID-19. And part of it is the uh, inadequately designed and accountability mechanisms are unclear, the visibility, of data and the processes of managing the supply chain is inadequate. And there may not be sufficient segmentation in the approach to supply chain, their supply chain uh, strategies. And private channels have not been always well utilized. There are a few examples, and I think you may have discussed some of this, uh, but I think uh, countries can do a little bit more in terms of using the private channels, which run and deliver products on a day-to-day. And then you've got the problem of weak procurement practices, some of which is maybe based on the sort of laws and regulations around procurement, but also some are just practices that really uh, limit the timeliness of uh, responding to get uh, products to where they need to be. And so in the context of the COVID vaccine and the $12 billion that the bank has announced, we undertook an effort to assess the readiness of countries to understand the deficiencies in the supply chains. And this is using the WHO VIRA tool, uh, the Vaccine Readiness Assessment tool, and also a more detailed, uh, quantitatively oriented uh, readiness assessment framework that we developed. And, uh, at least, and now we're getting to almost 39 countries where we've done this. But out of 21 countries assessed, 10 did not fulfill the minimum requirements for cold chain infrastructure and performance. And none of the 21 that had been evaluated had functional tracking and monitoring systems that were good enough for vaccines in place. So creating huge vulnerabilities for things like diversion, theft, and also circulation of fair products when you think of a new vaccine that is going to be uh, 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 deployed. That's a huge issue. And um, we, we are embarking on an effort now to help at least 100 countries um, improve their readiness before the vaccines start becoming available in the spring of 2021 in many low and middle income countries. Uh, because you have to get ready. You don't start getting ready when the vaccines are there. This is a slide from, I think, um, McKinsey and, 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 and others from September, just to give you for the mRNA vaccines, for instance, where you need the ultra cold chain infrastructure. Much of the world is not just ready for that. 
And I think that is an issue that we'll have to grapple with, given that this vaccines may be expensive and given uh, the, the, the cost of it, you can't afford to really waste it in a way. And so what do we need? I, I think uh, governments will need to really uh, step up in terms of uh, grabbing this issue of anticipating the gaps and also managing. This morning, we sent letters to almost uh, 70 ministers of health and finance really to help them get on the way of assessing their readiness and filling the gaps before vaccines and other commodities uh, that are necessary to deal with the pandemic. So government relationship is key, but they will also need to provide the financial and human resources, capable hands, trained uh, uh, experts uh, in this subject, but also the resources and to explore partnering with the private sector as key part of being able to deliver. And we as uh, financiers, along with donor partners, must align and collaborate around countries. Uh, the collaboration is not just at the global level. Uh, I, I think uh, it could be sort of the, the local context matters and putting governments in the driver's seat uh, and then donors supporting them to, to, to solve the problems uh, will be key. And then having good data systems for tracking and having visibility in terms of where products are in the supply chain will be key. Uh, it will be key to holding everyone accountable, governments, non-governmental actors, external partners, and then to explore technology solutions uh, as key part of the, 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 the effort to live from, because we've not really dealt with something on this scale before. And so um, I'll just say that uh, for, for, for us, not only the short term, we also need to look at sort of the longer, longer term supply chains. We saw in March where some parts of the world basically were locked out, not, they don't have much uh, because the manufacturing capacity is very limited. Uh, even on the vaccines front, I think there are parts of the world where the manufacturing capacity isn't there. So uh, I hope uh, Vera Songwe mentioned this uh, yesterday in her speech uh, to you, the idea of regional manufacturing hubs basically is such that in fact, uh, in the future, you have a decentralized uh, set of capabilities and then use COVID-19 as an opportunity to accelerate the digitization of uh, supply chains and to continue to invest in enabling agile public sector supply chains and to consider new investment vehicles for private sector distribution models and quality assurance. That would be a key import, uh, key, key. And then to do a little bit of reimagination, and I put this here really acknowledging that you're the experts in this, and this is the uh, Global Health Supply Chain Summit, but to think about new business models and new technologies uh, that can help deal with this issue. And some of which are already on the way, uh, Zipline uh, is there, and there are several others as well that are out there. I'm not going to uh, go into that because, but the point that I really wanted to make here is that we need to think, uh, to, to think differently about supply chains before COVID and after COVID and take advantage of new technologies and new business models. And Africa in particular has an opportunity given the challenge that it had before, but now with technology to really leapfrog in a substantive way uh, to move this agenda forward. And so, in summary, uh, I think the three key uh, uh, thrusts I will say, we all need to think whether public or private sectors uh, think of not only the products, the commodities, but also how they will be delivered uh, in the boards, whether the bank, IFC, whether it's private corporations or whether within government uh, cabinets uh, in, in, in governments. But to think also about how we will execute uh, what we are trying to do in terms of uh, building, training, deploying the supply chain expertise, and also using private sector innovation to help us execute, to deliver the products where they are needed, and to be able to hold each other accountable and use digital technology and management practices to achieve the results, and not to forget also engaging the users, uh, the communities that we hope to, 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 to influence. So I will stop here, Ravi, and this is just an overview of uh, really the bank group, and what uh, we do and how we do it with partners and what we've done on the COVID-19 and some few thoughts in terms of supply chain that I thought might be useful or relevant uh, for the discussion that you have in this summit. And once again, 
Thank you very much for inviting us to share these thoughts. Over to you, Ravi. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Pate. This was a wonderful uh, tour de force, if you will, going across the various spectrums, introducing us to the World Bank group, uh, the various agencies within uh, units within the World Bank group, but also trying to uh, highlight using specific examples. I like really the emphasis that you have put on uh, in, in, within the GFF, you know, some of the supply chain country examples you gave with Uganda, Nigeria, as well as Mozambique, and then bring it to the current situation, which is the uh, your group's response to COVID-19 uh, in terms of both financing as well as uh, emphasizing the need to build uh, the proper infrastructure uh, and I, I really like the comment that distribution of vaccines perhaps is even more challenging than the research and production of vaccines. In some ways, this is about uh, managing centralized supply chains versus globally dispersed supply chains, especially cold chain capabilities, et cetera. And so this is uh, just excellent. Uh, you know, before I, uh, you know, Take a few questions from the Q and A box. Uh, I had a, a couple of questions uh, for you. I mean, I also like the emphasis you made about it's not just uh, uh, centralized, global, or country level response, but the community level response, right? And uh, I would I would appreciate if you could speak to a little bit. And I was uh, just the other day listening to one of the interviews you gave in 2016 with Dr. Ashish Jha. Uh, on uh, the success you had in Nigeria in getting community level uh, engagement um, for polio eradication. Um, so, I mean, that was polio, we don't have to visit polio, but generally, what do you see, uh, you know, how, what are, I mean, you talked about the success of Nigeria uh, going from vertical systems to more horizontal integrated systems. You know, could you share some core learnings about how to make that possible? Because that seems to be a huge challenge in many countries. Yeah, thank you. I think this is very pertinent, uh, uh, especially today. It is really about connecting the global um, imperative with sort of local felt needs and framing the discussion in a way that uh, communities feel that you're also responding to your, their needs. So in the case of polio, it was a vertical program. It was an eradication effort, but it wasn't felt as such a, as a priority in every, let's say, community. And I think when we come to COVID, COVID has had a disproportionate impact across the globe. In many parts of the world, it's not uh, seen as much of a threat in Africa in particular, because the numbers are less. And so reconciling that with the need to actually vaccinate large populations, given that the huge economic impact of this pandemic will require really uh, uh, using trusted channels to, uh, to, to, to let communities understand that, uh, for, uh, that the threat is there and in an open and transparent manner uh, that the leaders have been truthful to them and that uh, the vaccines are safe uh, if they are proven to be safe and efficacious so that they can be able to use them and that they own it as opposed to the approach of saying, let's go and do it to communities, uh, but rather to sort of do it with communities and let them also have a say in holding actors accountable within their own uh, uh, responsibility. That will be very key. And that's one of the lessons I think from the polio eradication effort that will be relevant as we think about COVID-19 vaccines because otherwise you could have the disconnect where globally we feel this is a major issue. Uh, but when you go to villages, if you go to my village in uh, Northeastern Nigeria, for instance, they may not see uh, COVID-19 as the threat that you may be seeing, let's say in New York or in Northern Europe. And so how do you convince them to take a new vaccine? And so that is a challenge that we all have to grapple with, but governments have to be really in the lead and leaders have to step up and be very straightforward with the communities that they lead. Right. Uh, there is a question from uh, one of the uh, attendees, uh, uh, Mr. Samle Khan uh, He thanks uh, you for sharing many of these examples of improvements in last mile emergency response, et cetera. And the question he has is, is it possible to deploy the resources investments in key LMIC countries to build what he's calling centers of excellence, where we can have sustained efforts with committed public-private partnerships? to enable long-term sustainable 
systems, which can then run on its own. So you've talked about, you know, uh, building local capability, et cetera. So, uh, so the question really, is it possible to deploy? So I guess, you know, I would expand that question saying, what may be some of the barriers, you know, when you think in terms of, and it, you know, it's similar, I would just add to that question. You talked about various countries and where you're making investments. And how do you determine which countries do you choose to make investments in as a World Bank group? And then the nature of the investment is it, uh, how do you ensure that it is going towards building a center of excellence so that you know, they can ultimately run things on their own, the countries? Yeah, thank you. So the, the bank works with its clients, like I mentioned, um, almost each of the IDA and IBRD countries have an engagement pact, so to speak, with the bank, which is jointly arrived at based on the constraints that they have, the ministries of finance, the ministers, the government itself basically determine collectively the priorities of what it will like the bank to, to finance. So it depends on sort of the national vision, their own national plans, but uh, the bank comes in with analysis, provide advice uh, based on learnings that can come from other parts of the world, from the country itself, and to say, okay, how best do we use these resources in the current context? So in certain countries, uh, for instance, you mentioned again, going back to my country of origin, Nigeria, um, the Centers for Disease Control, for instance, that Nigeria has, the National Centers for Disease Control, was really an effort of the national, of the federal government of Nigeria to have an institution dedicated to public health. But partners rallied around it and the bank substantively, substantially invested in it, some of the bank's resources to strengthen the core capabilities of the National Centers for Disease Control in Nigeria. Similarly, the Africa Union has the Africa Centers for Disease Control. That's a regional centers of disease control. And the bank has invested in that Africa Regional Center for Disease Control. And there are several countries, at least 16, where national public health institutions have been developed, strengthened through the bank financing. In the COVID-19 response, we thought that we should be explicit about strengthening national institutions. At the end of the day, the external financing that the bank or others bring to countries will be temporary. It may last five years, six years, whatever it is. By the end of the day, what would we leave behind? And I think that is a function of also national leaders having the vision, how they would like to use this crisis then to build their national institutions so that it's not just transactional, but that it's really a transformational opportunity for them. And so the framework that we have is adaptive, but at the end of the day, it's national leaders that will have to make those choices. And we would very much like to see them investing in strengthening their national institutions. All right, thank you. Um, there was uh, a question here, which is seems to be related to something that I asked before. Why has there, why has achieving integration of fragmented health supply chains been such a challenge across many countries? What are some of the core barriers, and what could your organization do, or what has it, what has it been doing? Yeah. So I, I will answer this from the perspective of um, my past, basically, where I've seen the inefficiencies. Part of it is really lack of um, visibility in terms of how inefficient those parallel and fragmented uh, supply chains are overall. Because in many places, they sort of really operating in their own little worlds and the information doesn't really come together. Part of it is also incentives in terms of there may be some really, uh, um, I would say wrong incentives really, uh, in, in particularly for pharmaceutical procurement, whereby uh, vested interests really prefer to go one way or the other and would not like to lose control. And I think that's a, a key issue. Again, uh, but when you, when you measure and you track and you make it visible, it becomes untenable uh, to compare if there's a threefold difference, let's say in delivering one product versus another. And I think that's sort of how to solve that uh, issue to help everyone sort of come to grips with the fact that it's inefficient or it's not delivering um, what it's supposed to do and, 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 and make it better. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, the, um, this is more of a, I would say a kind of 
skeptic question, I would say, uh, does the World Bank financing actually lock low-income countries into perpetual debt, which may dissuade countries from accessing funds to finance procurement of quality health commodities and also solve complex pandemic supply chain issues? So how do you ensure that this doesn't happen from, from your organization's perspective? Yeah. So the bedrock of financing of health systems uh, in many countries, in almost all countries, I would say, is their national resources, is domestic resources. And the external financing is oftentimes uh, a smaller proportion of the total health spend within a country. So where there are gaps, I think it makes sense for countries to look at all sorts of financing, including grants, including concessional financing like from the bank or from other multilateral agencies, uh, grants from Global Fund, Gavi also are out there. Uh, and to be able to use those combination uh, while countries are addressing their immediate needs, because we know that improved health also links to economic uh, uh, development and it links to economic growth. And we've seen the lack of investment in health by itself can bring economies to a halt. And so if uh, the economic dividends from investing in health, it would make sense if there are gaps governments choose to finance part of their health spending from multilateral uh, development banks. And within multilateral development banks, there is a portion of the financing. What I mentioned, IDA, for instance, what people don't know is that many countries receive their IDA as fully grant finances. The weakest countries get the IDA resources from the World Bank as grant. Some receive it as 50% grant based on their performance and some receive it as either credit. There are fewer countries that receive it as either credit and either credits are 0% interest. They only pay a commitment charge and they have 10 year moratorium and 30 year repayments. So for the poorest countries in the world, the bank financing is the most concessionary that they can find. You cannot find that out there in the markets. So uh, that's why it's targeted towards the poorest countries. But at the end of the day, it's how countries use those resources. Right, right. Wonderful. There is a question here. What is the critical motivating? So you talked a lot about the private sector, engaging private sector. And if you think about engaging private sector and supply chains, and you give an example, I believe it was uh, for one of the countries, the uh, first countries you talked about, which is Uganda, uh, you know, the question about outsourcing to private sector, some supply chain functions. What are some barriers or motivating factors for governments to begin to outsource? Because there's a chicken and egg problem here, right? If the private sector, if there is no well-functioning private sector logistic services market, then government will hesitate to outsource. Uh, on the other hand, you know, government, even if there exists, there might be some hesitancy from the government to outsource. So how do we break that barrier? And what, how would we motivate governments to begin to outsource more of their supply chain functions to private sector? and in the process, build the capability of these of supply chains in those countries. So that's a, a very good question. And I think it's sort of, if I can uh, reframe it, how do, you, how, how do you motivate leadership to do the right thing? Yeah, that's true. How do you uh, motivate leaders and empower them with information to make the choices, difficult as they may be, to deal with forces that actually uh, uh, benefiting from a system that isn't working in the supply chain and to change their ways and to outsource it because it's more efficient or it will deliver the goods. I think that's a big question that uh, is part of it. External actors like us can help, uh, but I think a large part of it is also domestic. Country after country, we have seen with the COVID-19 pandemic, how countries, whether they are wealthy, middle income or low income, the role of national leadership is one that transcends all country typologies and leaders can choose to do the right thing or can choose to do the wrong things. And how do you motivate them to do the right thing? That's an open question. And I am not sure I have the right answer for it, Ravi. Yeah, yeah, no, that's, that's, I think ultimately it's about, as in private sector, it's about leadership, right? So, uh, and country level leadership and how one can influence that. Uh, want to close with one last question that has come up and I want to expand that this is around vaccines. That is, you've talked a lot about the investments that uh, your bank group is making on uh, you know, distribution of vaccines. You talked about cold chain and the country readiness uh, frameworks that you have developed. Uh, but uh, 
connected to that is there is a mis potential mismatch between the current vaccines. It's a race. I mean, there are two vaccines that are mRNA vaccines that are out there. And just what we've seen, uh, Pfizer requires some extreme cold uh, storage kind of thing, which capability does not exist. Uh, how do you begin to match the cold chain capabilities needed with what vaccines are coming out? I mean, this is a huge challenge in some ways, right? Yes, it is. I, I think, uh, and it's sort of dawning on us because the front runners keep changing uh, yeah. and there will be more vaccines coming along. And I suspect that some of the next generation of vaccines will see how efficacious they would be right, right. and they may be more operationally feasible. Uh, we don't know that yet, uh, but suddenly the ultra cold chain is not something that we would anticipated, at least in many countries, because the capacity is not there for that. Yeah. Um, and that's scope for innovation, I think, both on the part of the manufacturers to sort of see to what extent they can organize the delivery systems closer to where the commodities can be delivered. We know that uh, the ultra cold chain, the freeze, deep freeze, it, it gets all, up to a few days, let's say, before delivery. And so uh, I think there's scope of, uh, for, for innovations, not only in terms of the technology, but also how to organize the delivery of that. But that's a, that, that's a, a barrier at the moment because many countries are not really ready for that. Wonderful. I wanted to create that segue, even though the leadership was probably the best place to stop, because our next panel coming in is focused on vaccines. So hopefully they'll pick up from what you just said and expand on that for our attendees. Uh, with that, uh, Dr. Pate, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for uh, taking uh, you know, time out of your uh, busy schedule to share your thoughts and your work. Uh, you're very well regarded in the community. Uh, uh, so thank you so much, really appreciate it. Thank you, Ravi, thank you. Okay. Bye -bye. Thank you.